Hey everyone, Jonathan Baylor here and really, really excited about today's show because I think we're going to have a lot of fun. We have a wonderful author, entrepreneur, cook, and general food enthusiast, so you know I love her. We have none other than the author of the brand new Hungry Girl 200 Under 200 Just Desserts, the star of the Hungry Girl television show on the Food Network and the Cooking Channel, the author of seven best-selling books, and the proprietor of Hungry-Girl.com. Lisa Lillen, welcome to the show. Hello, hello, Jonathan. Thank you so much. Good to be here. Thank you so much for being here. Exciting times with a brand new book coming out. But Lisa, one thing I wanted to get started with right out the gate is I can imagine some of my listeners might be a little surprised that you're here on the show because, uh, for example, your new book, Hungry Girl 200 Under 200, Just Desserts, one of those 200s refers to a calorie count. And here on the Smarter Science of Slim, we often focus on food quality. And we talk about how when we eat high quality, nutrient dense, satiating foods, that those take care of calorie quantity for us and counting calories can become a bit irrelevant. However, if people look a little bit deeper into your message, I think they will find that we share more similarities than we have differences. Yeah, I totally agree. I was just going to say, I don't think those two things are mutually exclusive um, by any stretch of the imagination. And, you know, Hungry Girl, the brand itself, tries to help people seek out foods that are satiating, that are better choices for them, that make them feel fuller. And um, I I think, you know, in my world, calorie counting is part of the equation, though, because unfortunately, a lot of people even when they're satiated, if they don't pay attention, they take in way too many calories and that's what causes them to ultimately gain weight. So though it doesn't always have to be the the only thing people are thinking about, it should, in my world, be part of what they think about, you know, as part of the big picture. Well, Lisa, I think you hit on two really, really important points there where you said if we pay attention, that's a very important point, pay attention to what we're doing, eating consciously, and then also that we're full. I mean, your, your story, your story. If, I, if I'm getting this correct here, is that you you are not a scientist. Uh, you are just an individual who is so uh, constantly impressed by how much delicious food you can eat and still stay slim and trim. And in fact, uh, back in the day, you had struggled with your weight for decades, but then simply eliminated insane starches and sweets, were able to drop a vast amount of weight, and now ha- are just trying to find ways to. Again, as your brand is called Hungry Girl, you're not about hunger, but at the same time, we want to be conscious about what we're doing. So how do we find that balance? Well, I think it it is all about paying attention to your body and what you're craving and what foods make you feel certain ways when you eat them. I always say that people should try to identify their trigger foods, and that is really what helped me ultimately. And trigger foods are foods that cause you to eat more, cause you to eat uncontrollably, and for everyone, it's a different type of food. I mean, for example, I, for me, it is starches, it's chips, it's potatoes, it's pasta, it's anything that's very like bread, bagels. For a lot of other people, it's chocolate. I can have one M&M and be satisfied, but I can't have one potato chip. I have to eat the entire bag of potato chips. So once you learn how to sort of avoid the foods that you know are not great for you and the ones that are going to make you overeat to a crazy degree... That is definitely a major step in the right direction. Too often, people are looking to other people to tell them exactly what to eat. And sure enough, anyone who follows a plan that's very specific for a set period of time is going to have success. But I don't really see how that helps you for the long haul. For the long haul, you have to figure out what works for you and make decisions every single day for the rest of your life that are going to affect you, know, you maintaining and you know, achieving and maintaining a healthy weight. Lisa, I think you hit the nail on the head there when you said it's so focused for each for us, each of us to individually find that which works for us. And I also really like your point. Of, you, you've talked about this on many, many media outlets where there are so often sometimes individuals can think health and fitness is about deprivation and, and just completely never, for example, like, oh, my gosh, I can never taste anything sweet for the rest of my life or I can never taste anything that's somewhat like a noodle for the rest of my life. And a lot of your work focuses on how, again, we're not trying to be perfect here, so maybe you have some shirataki noodles, or maybe you use a a, a more sane sweetener, such as a xylitol or a stevia, but you don't need to be hungry or be deprived to be healthy, correct? 
exactly. I mean, first of all, I, I, I do. I swap it up. I am like the swap master. I'm a mad scientist in the kitchen, so I'm always looking for ways that I can satisfy whatever craving I have and do it in a smarter way. But at the same time, I also live by the 80-20 rule, which means sometimes I eat the real stuff. It depends on where I am. I like to take advantage of certain situations. Like, I just was in Japan recently, and yeah, did I have ramen? Of course. Like, you know, I'm in Japan. I'm going to have ramen. It's not going to not happen. I had sushi. I ate rice. Typically, I don't eat those things, but every now and then you do. And it is about moderation. And I strongly believe in in exercising and moving more and, and just being very conscious and very, very aware of what is going into your face at all times. I would say you, you would probably agree with that philosophy. Oh, absolutely. Well, and I think you hit on another key point there when you mentioned you were in Japan. And because you're in Japan, you enjoyed some ramen. And that's much different than uh, I'm at Walmart and I'm going to buy some 19 cent ramen like you, you were you were in a situation where you had this amazing opportunity and it was a celebration and, and you enjoyed it. It wasn't a, in the office. Oh, there is some cookies sitting there. I'm just going to grab one every time I walk by. It was a very conscious action. Yeah, you're so right. I think that's the biggest problem. I feel like, you know, I had dinner with a friend a few weeks ago and we went to this beautiful seafood um, restaurant that had a lot of fresh grilled fish. The only thing on the menu that was like a terrible choice was the, the fish and chips. Everything else was like, you could get it grilled. There were all kinds of salsas and nice light sauces. And she just ordered the fish and chips. And that's the kind of, that's the person that's gonna reach for the, 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 you know, the 19 cent ramen and the, the cookies in the office. It's, you have to be accountable for your actions. And that's, you know, that's the bottom line. And, and Lisa, I think the, uh, the, the key thing to keep in mind here is that there are, I think there's, there's different kinds of people. Like one of the reasons I, I like your work and your message is that I too am a volume eater, something that you, you, you talk about so well, where there are some individuals who can just not eat very much and that's okay with them or, or, they, don't, or they don't need to eat a lot of food. Like they could eat something that was a little bit more dense just because they don't crave volume. For me, I just need a lot of food. Like, I need volume, and it sounds like you're the same. I am the same. I, I, that's why I like to find things I can eat large amounts of. I mean, I don't eat like a crazy person. I'm not like <laughs> Joey Chestnut or anything. But it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's important to, to eat big portions. And I know we're always told portion control, and it's a, it's a good message, but it's not reality for a lot of people. And a lot of people, if something seems too extreme for them, they tune it out. And I don't want people to tune out my message. And that's why I think of Hungry Girl as like a stepping stone. You know, if, if the world is eating fast food, bad food, and they're extremely overweight and 90 or whatever percent of our country is acting that way, and only like, I don't know, 0.001% are the like extreme eaters that are totally clean and doing everything like by the book. The reality is most people can fit somewhere in the middle. And I want Hungry Girl to help get people over to the other side and closer to being perfect. Most people, including myself, will never be perfect, but there's, there's a middle ground. It's not one or the other. And I think like the, the dessert book, the new dessert book is a great example of that, where I do use some packaged foods and I do use ingredients that some people might say are not healthy, quote unquote, but it's certainly better to have a 200 calorie small reasonable low calorie you know low fat dessert th than to go to the cheesecake factory and eat a slice of cheesecake that has 1750 calories so mm -hmm. well and i think that's awesome. it gets back to your message of understanding what each of us individually needs because i can imagine sometimes what you may what individuals and i i would not agree that this is the right approach for them to take with you which would be a, a criticism is saying that that uh, if, if I even do this 200 calorie uh, smarter dessert, well, that's going to be a trigger that is going to force me to do something worse than that. But I think your message is not that your message is if, if you are that individual, then you, you need to take a different route. Like, don't use this as the trigger food that's going to make you go crazy. Use this as the swap that will prevent you from going crazy. Because I think there's two different types of people there. There's people who, if you say just don't do anything, they'll do it for a week and then they'll go bananas and go completely off the ranch. And, and if those people have something to tide them over, they, they, can, they can hang on to that sanity and not go bananas, but that's not everyone, right? Exactly. I mean, what you said, I couldn't even have said it better myself. And that's exactly what it's for. So like even my own swaps, 
there's some of them that I eat a lot and all the time because they work for me. And some are like, eh, that's a little too triggery for me. So I'm not going to eat those all the time. And it's about what works for you. And people need to pay attention to their own bodies. And I think that's the number one thing that people don't do. They, they just want someone to hold their hand and tell them exactly what they must eat. And it, at some point, they're going to have to make decisions on their own. Well, and the thing that I think is so empowering, Lisa, about your message of these smarter swaps is you hit the nail on the head when you said there's this 0.001% of the population that's like really, really dialed in. I mean, it's like the 99 and 1% problem that we have in other areas of this country. But then there's the 99% where like literally if you were to take a cheesecake and I'm, this is me, I'm guessing, let's say you go to a restaurant and you eat a dish and then you take that same dish and prepare it at home, the exact same dish. I can almost guarantee you that the dish you prepare at home will be better for you because, for example, the type of oil you would use is completely different than the type of oil they'd use in the restaurant. So th there's almost always a way to swap and to do it smarter than you currently are, which has nothing to do with deprivation. Yeah, I totally agree. So there are certain foods that I just don't order in restaurants and certain things that I would always just have at home. And I think that that's a great way for people to approach this because – Again, it's not about depriving themselves forever. It's just about changing, altering how they approach a certain food. And I think that is a key message, Lisa, that we should all, I think, should resonate with all of us. Because if we look back even 50 to 60 years, right, people still ate People, it's not as if an emotional connection to food is a recent development, right? Like all throughout human history, people had treats and people had celebrations. But the one thing that they didn't have was this chronic consumption of edible products rather than food. And I, I see what you're getting to is you can get back to eating and enjoying food as long as you focus on doing it more intelligently rather than the sort of default diet we have today, which is just this chemical storm, <laughs> which is not at all conscious. We just unwrap and eat. But well, what you're saying... Lazy. We are lazy. I mean, I hate to say it, but we are lazy and getting lazier. Maybe it has to do with busyness. Maybe it just has to do with sloppiness and laziness, carelessness. But in general, people are lazy and they don't want to think too much and they want everything to be easy and they'd rather just grab something and not think about it. And that and then couple that with being hit with all the messages in the media, you know, and all the commercials and and all the very enticing products and foods that you see at all the restaurants like Chili's and 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 McDonald's and all the other fast food places. It's, it's very hard to resist. So it is an easy place to go to just grab something that's right in front of you. But um, that's not always the best option. You just have, I mean, we're just getting back to the same messages is being conscious and being accountable and not making excuses. People have to own up, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and Lisa, have you seen uh, individuals? So the message you're describing here is you've got an individual who's, let's say, completely off the ranch. And this would describe the vast, vast majority uh, of individuals uh, alive in Western countries today. And they start making these smarter swaps. Do you, do you see individuals then wanting to take it a little bit further, or do you find that a lot of individuals just find a happy ground in this, I'm not perfect, but that's okay, as long as I don't become obese and diabetic, that's good enough for me? I see both, actually, and both impress me and make me happy. There are plenty of people that say to me, you know what, I started using your recipes and I love what you do, but I took it a little further and now I won't use any artificial sweeteners, and I won't... Um, I'm totally eating clean now and I don't eat anything from a package. And I, I love that. I love that so much. And I, I actually, even, you know, with Hungry Girl recipes, whenever possible, try to focus on using fresh vegetables and fruits and lean meats and, you know, lean dairy. And I know that it's just, if, if I use some of the package stuff or some of the recipes, it's going to help a lot of people and they might end up using that forever and ever. And some people might just move on and never use it again. I mean, Personally, in my life, I don't eat a ton of packaged foods. I eat kind of boring. I eat a lot of fish. I eat lean meats. I eat tons of fruit. I love vegetables and salads. I don't eat tons of the other stuff, but I eat some of it. I eat a bar every now and then. I, I will, you know, obviously have Hungry Girl recipes. But, it, you know, wherever people go with the, with the knowledge that they learn, as long as it's a better place than they started from, I'm happy. 
Oh, exactly. And as long as it's making them happy, I think so often we get so when I say we, I mean, just individuals out there spreading any message of, of health and wellness. We can sometimes get trapped in focusing on the means rather than the ends. Right. The ends is an individual who is able to to give back to society all the gifts that they've been given and are happy and feel emotionally fulfilled and, and are are contributing wonders to the world as, as we are all, all intended to do. And there is different ways for people to achieve that. I'm sure for some people, I mean, actually statistics show that for 4.6% of the population, portion control works really, really well. Like, so they can just eat whatever they want as long as they eat 1,200 calories of it, and that works for them. And I'm sure there's another 5% of the population that might work doing something else and another 5% that works doing something else. What matters is that it works, right? Right, wow, 4.6%. I didn't realize it was even that low, but that does not surprise me. That's, that's amazing. But yeah, if you, I know I have friends, we all have friends. They have one bite of cheesecake and they're happy. And I'm like, oh God. <laughs> I, wanna, I mean, I'm not even a sweets person, but I, it's very hard for me. Again, the only thing I can do that with is an m M&M. I'm not a chocoholic. But even desserts, you know, it's hard to take one bite of anything and be satisfied. So, you know, I, I totally hear what you're saying and you are correct. And Lisa, what are your thoughts on... We see today there's such there's this trump that food manufacturers have up their sleeve, which is serving sizes. And as we've seen from these hundred calorie snack packs, you could literally take anything and call it a low calorie treat if you just shrink the serving size to be small enough. <laughs> how do we how do we defend ourselves against that? I know I, I find that annoying because I think early on they really took care and they tried so hard to find things that they could give decent serving sizes of. And then they just got lazy and they said, oh, here's a hundred calorie brownie. And it's like the size of your pinky. And I don't love that. So again, people have to pay attention to what they're getting. And then I always talk about foods being good bang for your calorie buck. My favorite hundred calorie pack is broccoli coleslaw because it's like a tremendous package of vegetables that you can basically make a huge entree with. And it's a hundred calories. So, you know, a hundred calories looks very different depending on what the food is. And People need to just pay attention and see if it seems like a good deal. And, and again, that's, a, that's such a key thing for us to focus on, which is, is it working for you? I know there's going to be listeners out there that are going to listen to this podcast and say, well, well, what about bacon? Like we love bacon and we love uh, enjoying whole food, natural fats. And that's absolutely true. But let's be very clear here that there are some individuals out there, for example, that really like the taste of of fats. And we're going to have to have a different strategy for those people than for people who may really, really actually prefer the taste of sweets. And, and how, do, how do you address, in, in your world, those two distinct types of people, Lisa? Well, since I, I don't often tell people exactly what to eat and I give them ideas, but I tell them to be more aware of what they should and, 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 and shouldn't be eating based on what works for them. You know, I, I think that you're right. People, some people are bacon lovers or avocado lovers or they love nuts and they're fat cravers. I happen to be one of those people. But if I have the avocado, if I have the bacon, I'm not having it with mayo. I'm not having it with fatty dressing. It's it's about giving and taking. And people used to make fun of people who ordered french fries and a Diet Coke or I'll have a club soda and a, you know, a giant hamburger. I feel like you save where you can and you're not going to deprive yourself of everything that you want for the rest of your life. So you have to find a way to work it in 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 a smart way that works for you. And Lisa, that you're not you're certainly not alone there. My father works in addictions counseling, and there is, of course, if someone has a problem with drugs, where we want to get them in an ideal world is is to not use drugs anymore. But we're even talking about drugs such as like nicotine and alcohol. But there's also another world where if you have an individual that smokes three packs of cigarettes a day and you can get them down to smoking a few cigarettes per day, anyone who says that isn't a win. I will go on record as saying is a fool because you have clearly reduced the damage. It's, it's, it's damage minimization, right? It's, it's true. But you know, the thing about like addiction to alcohol and nicotine and things of that nature is you can definitely live without having those things at all. And you really obviously can't live without having food at all. So it's much harder for food addicts than it is to, for even, you know, people who are addicted to drugs, I think. But I do think it's a win. Three cigarettes are better than 30 or 40. Well, and even when we have food addicts, right, is even if you can find, for example, I am a chocoholic. That's that's one area where we differ. And I order 
undutched, completely natural, unsweetened cocoa in 10 pound bags. And I've found all sorts of ways to use like xylitol or stevia to make wonderful chocolatey desserts. And what I find is if, if you are a food addict, if you can just focus on food rather for me than like a Hershey's bar, which is an edible product, mm -hmm. that in and of itself will take you so far. Yeah, I agree. And, and, and look what you've done. If, if you help people think like that and think creatively and help them find solutions, it'll also make them feel like they accomplished something and they're more likely to follow a better plan or be more conscious and more aware of what they're eating. And I think that's great. That's a really great message to send. Well, thanks, Susan. I think we all somehow acknowledge that, but we lose sight of it when it comes to eating. Because, for example, with exercise, most of us all agree that, like, getting up and doing, like, let's just let's just be more active. Let's walk. Let's take the stairs rather than the elevator. And if someone is taking the stairs rather than the elevator, we don't say, "Oh, you fool, you fool! Why don't you go run a triathlon?" We say, we say, well, it's great that you're taking the stairs. That's a good step in the right direction. And in fact, if you take the stairs enough chances are you might want to do more. So, so how do we help people to focus on improvement rather than perfection? Well, I mean, and that is the exact reason why I think Hungry Girl is popular because it's about making smarter choices and every little thing counts. There are so many messages that come at us from the media where that make you feel bad about yourself. If you're not a gym rat, if you're not in you know, doing all kinds of intense exercise. If you're not only eating organic and perfectly and clean and raw or whatever, you have to feel bad about yourself. But that's just not the case. Every little small change you make makes a big difference. If you park further from the door at the mall, if you take the stairs instead of the elevator, if you walk with a friend instead of just sitting on your butt and gossiping, you can walk for an hour and gossip. It's the same thing. Every little thing counts. I used to be deathly afraid of exercise and now I exercise every single day. Every, you can do it. Anyone can do it. If I can do it, anyone can do it. Well, I think, Lisa, there's a lot of really deep psychology taking place there, too, because I often use the example of vegetarians, not necessarily because I think vegetarian is an optimal way to eat, but because vegetarians demonstrate just how powerful the mind is in the sense that for most people who aren't vegetarians, being a vegetarian seems like it would be the most challenging thing they could ever imagine. But vegetarians don't wake up in the morning and like struggle at every meal to avoid animal products. Like it's not a struggle. They define their self as a vegetarian and because they see themselves in a way, everything else becomes easier. And I think what we're talking about here is once you start taking these small steps and making these smarter swaps, you start to see yourself as a healthier person and you create this self-fulfilling cycle where you now want to make healthier choices. What do you think? I would not agree more. I think that you said that so eloquently and it is so true. And that's a place we need, we need to get people. It's a place where most people are not, but it's super important. And the key thing I think we're, we're hitting on with all of this is the easiest way to do that. And I actually really, really like this message. I'm getting, I'm getting goosebumps from our conversation here because I think what we're about, we're hitting on so many good truth nuggets is all throughout the day. And, and let's just not use this for food and exercise. I think it was Socrates or Aristotle that said the unexamined life is not worth living. Let's make sure that everything we do is something we do intentionally and is something we, we think about and we say, what are the consequences of this going to be? And the more we can do that, the more we can live consciously, eat consciously and move consciously. It seems like that's going to be nothing but goodness for ourselves and all of those around us. Jonathan, you are so right and really, really very smart and wish us luck with that because how do people do all of those things while texting incessantly? <laughs> that's, that's the real question. Oh, you're like, come, come back to the real world. Come <laughs> live consciously in the real world rather than in the digital world. It's so true. It's so true. I mean, we're all guilty of it too, but you, you know, it, it's, it is, it's important to be able to live in both worlds. Lisa, well, I actually, here's an, here's an idea, and I'm just I'm spitballing now, which is a lot of people I've seen, you know, they use Instagram or whatever or Facebook to do, quote unquote, food journaling. And that might be like if you're going to text or tweet all day, maybe every time you, you make a food or exercise choice, tweet that and have yep. a group of people following you that help keep you accountable. <laughs> uh, absolutely. I've seen that. And I used to joke about it. And it, it helps. I mean, it, it definitely helps. 
I always just say if you write things down, you don't need a fancy food journal. So if you write it down, and that could be by tweeting it or texting it or just scribbling on a piece of paper, if you write things down, you're more accountable. I mean, because people are in denial about what they're eating and they don't pay attention to it. But if you have to, like, document it somehow, there's a really good chance you're not going to eat everything that you would have eaten otherwise. And I think the key distinction here, Lisa, is the reason we need to be conscious. People, again, might go back and say, well, you know, 60 years ago, people just ate food and they didn't tweet and journal everything. And how did they stay so slim? Well, here's the difference. Those people were living in a different food environment, right? Not only did they not have all of these edible product, garbage, chemical engineered, addictive things we have today, but wheat and apples, for example, were completely different crops. Like that's not debatable. They were just different things. Apples had much less fructose in them. Wheat wasn't this hybridized nightmare. And those are just two of a few examples. So being in the risky food environment we are today, we, we do need to be conscious, but that doesn't mean we need to be perfect. And to me, that is a message of hope, and that is a message that can help the 99% rather than the point zero zero one who probably don't need any more help to begin with. Yep, you, you said it. I don't even need to add anything to that. <laughs> Lisa, well, I love it. Well, thank you so much for, for all that you do to, to help one, also keep this light and keep this fun because health should be light and health should be fun. And folks, if you want to learn more about Lisa, certainly there's no shortage of information out there. She's been doing this for quite some time on, on quite a, a national scale. And her brand new book is Hungry Girl, 200 Under 200, Just Desserts, a great resource for those looking to do better, but not necessarily too concerned about being perfect. And of course, check out her wonderful website, hungry-girl.com. Lisa, did I miss anything? And what's next for you? Um, no, just that people can, I guess, sign up for the daily emails, which ha I've been sending now. Now they go to over 1.2 million people every single day. And that's, you know, the heart and soul of what Hungry Girl is. So it's a daily reminder that people can and should be making smart choices and uh, more books on the way and just more fun Hungry Girl stuff. I love it. I love it. Well, stay hungry, Lisa. <laughs> really, really good talking to you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thank you, Lisa and listeners. I hope you enjoyed our conversation today as much as I did. And remember, this week and every week after, eat more and exercise less, but do that smarter.